that the winds and the currents brought some of it into Qingdao Harbor and ruined the, or in, interfered with the sailing. What they didn't mention was that in Shandong, in, in Sangu Bay, some of that algae also came in, which then stuck in the bay. And the problem is that algae respires. It takes up oxygen at night. It came in in such densities that it drove the oxygen out of the water at night, killed about $4 million worth of scallops, and, and before they could sort of, before it dissipated and all the rest of the stuff. So, so there's issues out there. They know about these things, but the point is, is that, um, you know, it doesn't mean that they're not concerned. It just means that they have other wolves at the door that they also have to deal with. And I'm not saying that this is something that is going to happen here, but it's something that we need to be thinking about. And so the takeaway message is for here, Canada seems to have a surplus of natural resources. And I'm just put it down here. Um, I find that there's, we have a lot fewer demographic related pressures. We just less people, right? We've got 40 times less people per kilometer, you know, so we, we have more time to, you know, sit and think. But what I find is that we also, we often tend to be more wasteful of our resources. Like, we don't really make the best use of them. We could be doing things more efficiently, but we've got lots of it, right? It's sort of like clam fishery. You know, when they started closing down the beaches because of sewage or whatever it was, it was like, don't worry about it. Just close that area and just move down there and, and until you run out of areas, in which case then it becomes a problem. That's, that's sort of our mentality, it seems. I just find that, you know, when the, the amount of industriousness that goes into making a living or whatever it is in China, because they're forced to do it, um, is, is not necessarily reflected here. But I think, you know, the other thing is we have the luxury of time, so we have the ability to think about what we want to do for the future. And that there's some things, you know, that we might want to copy and maybe some other things that we don't want to touch at all. But anyway, at least, you know, forewarned is forearmed. And with that, I'll say thanks. <laughs>
done some work in Scotland. That, that it was sort of how it was all, you know, this chain of events that led us there. But as you go further down China, there's more fish agriculture that goes on. Some of the bays are quite full. There's a lot of freshwater agriculture that goes, which we never touched at all. Um, so there's, it's a, it's a huge, uh, I mean, carp is big. Yeah, they, they produce an awful lot of carp. When you look at the statistics, you know, from FAO or, or whatever, there's, uh, China just dominates in almost every category. 20 years ago, about 80% of the fisheries product in, in China was aquaculture product produced. Well, they're having problems now. I mean, they're still arguing. I mean, there was like reading something there just the other day in one of the international news things on, you know, the Chinese are still fighting about the quotas in the Yellow Sea, you know, about fishing. I mean, that, that's just going on time and time again. I mean, it was with Korea. They're, they're, I mean, they're claiming territorial rights of, of you know, water and <clears throat> because they're, I mean, they just need protein and need the revenue. They need Boats going, it's all part of the enterprise. Yeah? Did you see any restoration of the coastal mangroves? No. But we weren't we weren't really into the, the mangrove. We were a lot of in the beach areas. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, I talked to them about restoration because I mean that was one of the things that I was seeing. It's like great as you go by, I mean I was gonna show some video, but it was pretty apparent from the air the satellite photographs, but as you go by, it's just pond up, pond up, pond up, pond up, pond up, pond up. And um, so I was asking, you know, are you looking at this? Like, what's happening to your foreshore? Uh, and they say, we realize there's an issue, but there's, I mean, we need to produce the food. That's, that's it. And so, I mean, the shrimp, it's, it went from shrimp, and then shrimp developed, developed a viral problem. And so all of a sudden, you had a, a big, you know, drop in shrimp production. So they immediately sent that into the labs to, to try to breed disease resistance into it and that sort of thing. But in the meantime, the sea cucumbers kind of took over from the basic down the freshwater crab. Jerry? A couple of questions. Uh, one, on your premise about world population and lots of food, we're somewhere over 7 billion now, right? And we're food out there go to bed hungry every night. Yeah. Now, no, is that a distribution problem? We have lots of food. What kind of a problem is it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're right now. I mean, it's it's the production of Canada. I mean, food is in general, food is not a problem in Canada. I mean, yeah, it is in small pockets. And I agree, it's a distribution problem. It's also a political problem. I mean, if we put our mind to it, the technology exists to get food everywhere. Right? I mean, it's it's not a, it's not an issue. It leads into my second question. You said that mixed farming is a real solution. It has not been the solution to agriculture of feeding people. In about 1880, we had 70% of the Canadian population directly employed on the land. Today it's 1.3. That's dangerous. It's factory farming. And that is how we've been able to feed masses of people because of increases in technology and uh, where it is, I don't know. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't argue with the history of it. I agree, that's what's happened. But as you look at this, this is sort of like falling off a building, right? I mean, by the first floor, you're still fine. But, you know, if you look at I me, mean, I was at a conference in Norway on sea lice, and where we're, we're looking at some of, well, never mind, we're looking at some of the implications of IMTA on sea lice for, for removal. The point is, they had a guy there that was talking about um, control of pests, so that the chemical control of pests. And so his, his specialty was not sea lice or aquatic system at all. He was a terrestrial, um, a, a terrestrial man, right? So he was into pesticides. And he was showing this graph over the last 50 years of the number of pesticides that were on the market and the over time, and they've been dropping steadily. Every, so we've had this huge number, and it's dropped to about half. And the issue was, is that as they go along, all of a sudden we're finding all these consequences of putting all these chemicals in the water. So now we're down to a subset of what we originally had 20 years ago. At the same time, we're now up to 350 species or something like this that are now documented, have, have you know, pesticide resistance or chemical resistance to some of the stuff that we have. 
His third graph was the number of new chemicals that were coming out. And because of all of the, the issues and the, the, the difficulties of, of getting you know, some of these drugs in, they have, or, well, the, the therapeutics in, they actually have to have a big enough market to justify all the expense. And agriculture isn't necessarily big enough to justify the investment to do that. So when you look at it, you, you're finding a case of diminishing returns, right? If you stay on the, the, the current trajectory, at some point, I mean, I ask them, when, if we're having all of these things coming together, so we have uh, a drop in the number of, of chemicals we can use, a drop in their effectiveness, and a very slow increase in the, in the number of new solutions to use, at what point does it come to, I mean, just draw the line, at what point do we, does it crash and we can't control any of the bugs and they eat all the stuff? And he said, well, you know, probably 25 years. So the, the point is, whether it's 25 years, whether it's 50 years, doesn't matter. The point is that he can see a point where it's not effective anymore with our current strategy and we have to look at something else. And as an ecologist, my approach is to look at something else from the, from the perspective of nature. What have other things done to do that? And so the whole idea of predation, you know, to control things happens. I mean, and although we're pretty rudimentary at doing it, I think that's really where the mixed farming comes in. It's not necessarily the fact that you stick a bunch of animals together that makes successful mixed farming. It's the right mix of species that we put together that makes mixed farming. And at the end of the day, at least for Canada, it's not necessarily about food. It's really about revenue and regional development. Right? I mean, we want the food, obviously. So, so if it's really about revenue, then maybe what we do is maximize revenue. And it's not necessarily just with one species. Maybe it's a mix of a number of species. And maybe it's not just for food. Maybe it's like taking the, uh, the, the extract and looking at other drugs that come along with it. But I mean, it's a philosophy, I think, that, has to be looked at differently. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to continue your discussion out in, in, in the gallery if you don't mind. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sean Rodney.